Massachusetts Senator Elizabeth Warren spoke in Des Moines, Iowa, days after announcing she was forming a committee to explore a run for president in 2020. After her remarks, she takes questions and she met with members of the audience. is I've caught a cold. <laughs> the good news is, yeah, nevertheless, I persist. <laughs> now, I want to start just by saying these are dangerous times for our country and the direction we go will in part be set right here in Iowa. I am grateful to all of you who take this seriously, who are in this fight all the way, and who are going to help us make a better country. So thank you. <laughs> Thanks for being here. I love that. OK. So I thought I'd just talk a little bit, tell you a little bit about myself and uh, why I'm in this fight. And then we'll just take some questions. And then afterwards, if you want to, we'll take some pictures, because that's a fun thing. Okay, so um, Isabella got it started. I grew up in Oklahoma, Big 12. Um, yeah, we got a few Okies here. Um, I grew up in a family, my daddy, um, he sold stuff. He sold uh, carpeting, he sold uh, paint, he sold housewares. Um, I have three older brothers. They all went off and joined the military. Um, they carry their veterans cards today, proudly. You bet. I was what used to be known as the late in life baby. My mom always called me the surprise. I was about 30 before it hit me what that meant. Uh, but it worked out. Um, so for a long time, it was just my mom and my daddy and me. And when I was in middle school, my daddy had a heart attack. And my mama and I thought that he was going to die. He didn't. Uh, he was in the hospital for a while. And then came home, but he couldn't work. And so the bills piled up. We lost our family station wagon. And at night, my mama would tuck me into bed. And I'd hear him talk. And I learned words like, mortgage and foreclosure. They're heavy words for a kid. One day I walked into my folks' bedroom and laid out on the bed was the dress. Now some of you know the dress. It's the one that only comes out for weddings, funerals, and graduations. And my mother had it laid out and she was pacing, pacing back and forth. She's in her stocking feet. And she was crying. And she was saying, we will not lose this house. We will not lose this house. We will not lose this house. She was 50 years old. She had never worked outside the home. And she was terrified. And so finally, she pulled that dress on. She put on her high heels, blew her nose. And she walked to the Sears and got a minimum wage job. And that minimum wage job saved our house. And it saved our family. And if you want to know who I am, there it is. That's the story written on my heart. And for a long time, I thought that story was a story just about my mother. A story about how she dug deep. And when she had to, she dug deeper. And then I started to understand years later, it's the story of millions of families across this country. People who do what needs to be done to take care of those they love. And then, years after that, I came to understand it's also a story about government. Because when I was a kid, a minimum wage job would support a family of three. Yeah. 
it would cover a mortgage, it would cover utilities, and it would still get basic food on the table. Today, a minimum wage job in America, full time, will not keep a mama and a baby out of poverty. That is wrong, and it's why I'm in this fight. Yes. So, it was a bumpy path for me. Um, I wanted to be a school teacher. We got any school teachers here? Whoa, there's one, good. I wanted to be a school teacher, but that meant college. There was no money for that, so, like I said, it's a bumpy path. I got a scholarship, dropped out of school, got married. <laughs> Smart. Um, my chance was a commuter college that cost $50 a semester. Yeah, yeah. An America that invests in young people. Um, I had babies, I went to a state law school, and I ended up as a professor. Now, that was pretty amazing. But the one thing I can tell you about all of my grown-up professional life is that it is centered around one fundamental question. What's happening to working families in this country? Why is it getting harder and harder for young people to be able to build some security? Why is the path getting rockier, and particularly rockier for people of color? Why is that happening in this country? Yeah. So, let me just lay it out a little bit. It's Washington. And think about it with the story I started out with. Back when I was a little girl, the folks in Washington, go back and check this, they thought about the minimum wage in terms of what does it take a family of three to survive? And that's where they thought the minimum wage should be set because it should be an opportunity, a gateway, a chance to get in. Today, the folks in Washington who are in charge think that the way to set a minimum wage is to maximize the profits of a multinational corporation. They work for the rich and the powerful, not for the rest of us. And it's not just there, it's throughout the system. Washington works great for giant drug companies, not for people who are trying to fill a prescription. <laughs> Washington works great for giant oil companies that want to drill everywhere, but not for people who are worried that this planet is going to burn up if we don't make changes. Washington works great for giant financial institutions, but not for people whose social security numbers get stolen. This is one step after another. Washington works for the rich and the powerful and leaves everyone else behind. This is corruption, plain and simple. And we need to call it out. It is corruption, and it is eating away at our democracy and at the very fiber of our lives. I'll just do a couple of quick ones. Today, in America, wages have basically not budged for the median family for an entire generation, but the cost of housing has gone up, the cost of getting an education has gone up. The cost of child care has gone up. The cost of health care has gone up. Families are in the squeeze because Washington's working for the rich. Yes. Let me do another one. Home ownership, number one way in America for middle class families to build wealth. It's generation after generation, it's how it works. 
Today in America, African American home ownership rates are the same as they were when housing discrimination was legal. Think about that. Yeah. And student loans. Like I said, I got a four year diploma at a cost that I could pay for on a part time waitressing job. Today, young people in this country are getting crushed by a trillion and a half dollars in student loan debt. We have got to turn this around. Understand the impact of this corruption. Whatever issue brought you here tonight, I guarantee it intersects through a Washington that's working for the rich and the powerful. Look, guns, gun safety, it goes through Washington. We can't do basic things that most of us agree on. Why? Because we've got the NRA calling the shots in Washington, not our democracy. <laughs> Climate, an existential threat to all of us. But the oil companies, the coal companies keep calling the shots in Washington. We have to fight back. We can talk about a lot of these pieces, but I want to put on the table an idea. And that is, we need change, but not just one statue here, or one law over there. That's not going to get the job done. We need big structural change. Yeah. Yes. big on this so let me give you some ideas and some examples and then we'll just we'll get to some questions so here's the first one we need to change the rules in Washington yes, yes. and it's about money in politics it's about the influence of money I have the biggest anti-corruption proposals since Watergate yes yes We block the revolving door between Wall Street and Washington, you think? Oh, I know, kidding. Or how about if we say that everyone who runs for federal office needs to put their taxes online? the rules in Washington. Citizens United, money and politics change the rules in Washington. That's one. Two, we got to change the rules in this economy. And here I want to start again with structural change. We got a problem where the big corporations, the billionaires, they're calling the shots. We need to strengthen our unions, our workers, our consumers, get some balance back in the system. Yes. And we need to attack head on the rising costs that are crippling middle class families. Health care is a basic human right. get an education without getting crushed by student loan debt. <laughs> child care. How about we join the rest of the developed economies and help pay for child care? And 
strengthen Social Security and protect our pensions. That's how we do this. So, we gotta change the rules in Washington. We gotta change the rules in our economy. And we've gotta change the rules in our politics. And that means we need to protect democracy. Here's my first idea. I want to see a constitutional amendment so that every American citizen has a right to vote and that vote will be counted. Yes. Yes. <laughs> and I'll just loop it back in to say one more time, we've got to get money out of politics, overturn Citizens United, return this democracy to the people where it belongs. Now look, I never thought I'd run for public office, not in a million years. It was not on my to-do list, not on my bucket list, not on my anything list. But here's the deal. My daddy ended up as a janitor. And I got a chance to become a public school teacher, a college professor, and a United States senator because America invested in opportunity for me. I am determined that we will be a country that invests in opportunity for every one of our children. That's why I am here. So this is about how we make change. And for me, I'll tell you exactly what I'm doing here in Iowa, and that is trying to build grassroots. Because I don't believe that democracy should be for sale to billionaires and giant corporations. I don't take corporate PAC money. Shoot, I don't take PAC money of any kind. I don't take money from federal lobbyists. This, yeah. This is about rebuilding what we do together. This is about rebuilding our democracy. Person by person by person across Iowa and across this country. So I'm going to do this grassroots. I hope everybody in here will sign up. We'll be part of this. ElizabethWarren.com. You can go there. <laughs> Volunteer. Be part of this. Get a sign, a bumper sticker, offer to make a few phone calls, pitch in five bucks. But make an investment in democracy because this is our chance. This is our chance. We, together, can dream big and fight hard and that's how we'll make change. Templeton. What, what's Templeton Rye. Okay. Hi, everybody. You all, uh, I think we're given uh, some tickets when you came in, uh, some raffle tickets, and we're going to draw tickets. some of these. There are two microphones, one up at the front on both sides, and we're going to draw some of these numbers. Uh, if you'd make room for people to come down with their tickets. And okay. Why don't we get somebody to give some tickets out over on this some side? Can we do that? Side. I'm going to call some of these pass first. Out some tickets. I'm asking them to do numbers. Okay. Nine three nine seven. Some tickets over there, Roger. Yeah, go ahead. Nine two seven one. 
We have a winner. <laughs> Giving away we a Weber right grill right after now. this. Nine okay. three nine six. Okay, here we go. Come on up. Good to see you, man. Hi. Hey. <laughs> First, hold on, hold well, on. Let's let him do some more. Have you done enough? Oh, okay. I'll do. You want some more? So some people can come on down. Uh, we got one. Good. Hi. Hold on one second. Ninety two ninety three. Ninety two ninety three. And one more. Okay. Okay. We ready? We'll at Am least I get ready? started. Okay. Okay. My name is Jeffrey Getz. Hello, Welcome Jeffrey. to Des Moines. Thank you. I love being in Des Moines. First, I want to thank you. I'm a bankruptcy practitioner, Chapter 11. Thank you for sponsoring the Bankruptcy Reform Act of 2018. Yes. You've already hit... It's, it's a nerd thing. It's, it's a nerd totally thing. Nerd. It's absolutely a nerd thing. But... It really matters to families in trouble and small businesses in trouble. So I'm just going to nerd out with you and say, oh, man, it's a good bill. Okay, good. <laughs> Much okay. appreciated. You've already hit on one of my top issues, which is the corrupting influence of money in politics. Yeah. Personally, my second issue is defense of the separation of church and state. It's been under tremendous attack. Would you give us your thoughts on that? So, you know... We talk about, in separation of church and state, the importance of each person being able to, for free exercise, to be able to worship as you want. What worries me now in America is whether that's turning into a weapon. You know, when I see a case like Hobby Lobby, in which a corporation's free exercise has to be protected, and that means the corporation does not have to provide a full range of health services for women. This has become, in a case like Hobby Lobby, a tool just to advance an ideological agenda. I think Hobby Lobby is wrong. I think it's, and we have to fight back on this. I, look. I was a fifth grade Sunday school teacher. That's a long story in itself. <laughs> All I can say is no one was injured. <laughs> it was a very low bar. <laughs> but I believe this is what makes our country great, is that people are free to choose their religion or to choose no religion at all. But they don't get to use that to keep others from their rights. Thank you. It's a good question. Okay, who's next? Have we got one? Do we have one over here? We had one over here? Where are we? You here? Good. Okay. Okay. Uh, first of all, thank you for coming to Iowa and bringing a positive message. You bet. Uh, I wanted to ask, um, how do you debate someone who isn't interested in civility or facts? <laughs> Did you have someone in specific in mind? Well, let, let, me, let me just preface that with, it's, it's for you, a question for you, but like also for us. No, like, it is. What can we do? So, here's how I see this. We have a chance now, over the next uh, year and three quarters, to get out there and talk about something we haven't talked about nearly enough, and that is what we're fighting for. And I believe that when we get a chance to do that, we can actually come together on this. Listen, remember I told you I grew up in Oklahoma? All three of my brothers still live in Oklahoma. And one of my three brothers is a Democrat. <laughs> We're working on it. <laughs> but here's good. Here's the deal. I love all three of my brothers. And what I believe is that whatever else is going on, the noise and the nonsense and the wind and the craziness, we got to stay focused on what matters to us. And what matters to us is that everybody gets 
a fighting chance to build something. What matters to us is that people get a chance to get an education without getting crushed by student loan debt. What matters to us is that people get access to health care that they can afford, and it's real, and it's there in rural hospitals and communities all across this country. I think that when we talk, I, I have to tell you, I've been talking about corruption for a little while now. I got this bill together. Yeah, you're nodding, you're saying, I love corruption. I am so into this. But here's the deal. You don't have to persuade people. You don't have to go out and say, let me show you the 45 pieces of evidence of corruption. Democrats, Republicans, and independents get it. Okay, not 100% of them. There are some who are signed on in a different direction, but they get it. They know our government is broken, and they know that it's working for all those who've already made it big and it's not working for their families. And that needs to be the place that we start. That's how we begin to build a movement and change this country. That's what I believe. Thank you. <laughs> Go ahead. Do we have another one? We had more. 9320. 9320? Have you got one? Are you one of these? Yeah. Okay, sure. Okay. Okay. Um, first off, it's been a few years, but I remember you talking about um, letting students refinance their uh, loans duh. through the post office. Yep. And I haven't heard that for a while, but I think that's a great idea. Thank you. Um, so I think as Democrats, we need to run as the party of the people. Yep. And what do you think is the big anchor issue that we can use, not just to join progressives together, but the American people, so they understand that you're fighting for not just the middle class, because we need to help build up the middle class. How can we build up the working class? So it's a great question. And for me, the center part of this is about opportunity. You know, look, like I said earlier, it's not like I have tested this out with some focus groups or done a bunch of polling. I'm in this fight that's been the same fight of my lifetime. And it's a fight to make sure that the chances I got are there for other kids. That the chances to build something are real. And I watch every day as those chances are denied to young people that they are denied to people of color, they're denied to immigrants, they're denied to people in the LGBTQ community, they're denied to Native Americans, over and over and over. A rocky path gets rockier and rockier. I believe that what we need to fight for is an America where it's just a level playing field. I don't think people are asking for a handout. They just want a chance. They work hard, they play by the rules, they can do this. And I think that's where we started. And I do have to say it, we gotta call corruption out. We gotta call it for what it is and stay on it. Yep, good, good. We got some more. Okay, we got some more. Okay. 9261, 9296, under the eye, 93, 53. Got those tickets. There are two mics. That side Here we go. and this side. Just make one. your way on up there. Bring your ticket on. Bring your come ticket. Come on up. This system come on works down. really well in Massachusetts, <clears throat> I'm told. It does. <laughs> it's going to work in Des Moines. The idea is everybody gets a chance to ask a question, not just the people who run to the front. So well, let's see if we can make this work. We got somebody? Good evening. My name is Amber Sellers, and I'm from Kansas, um, Olathe, Kansas, well, Shawnee, Kansas specifically. And um, we traveled three hours to be here, and I'm. Oh, bless you. And I want to take a quick That's to commitment. Say that I, I, I'm impressed. Thank you. I appreciate you. the opportunity to be here, and I want to say that 
you are probably one of the most natural feeling candidates that I have met and that speaks volumes and I hope that this is not the last time we see you and that we see you in a more presidential <laughs> position. <laughs> at the, uh, yeah. um, the Thank you. I am a recent public administration graduate and my focus was health equity and housing. Yep. And I wanna know as a someone who is on the grassroots, who experiences um, housing inequality, who is um, rent burden, who does not work a job that will allow them the opportunity to own yep. a home. And I know that your the recent bill that you recently introduced. I'm gonna talk about it. Yes, please talk about it because I know maybe there's probably a lot of people here who don't know about it. But as someone who's on the who's on the ground, what can I do to keep pushing that message in my community about fabulous. inclusivity and housing affordability for everyone? Okay, fabulous. So, how many people in here worry about the rising cost of housing? Yeah, hands, right. So here's the deal in America. Let's, let's, let's really wonk out for a minute here. New construction in America has moved to the high end. So if you're rich, there's a lot of housing opportunities. But if you're middle class, working class, working poor, or poor, poor, what's basically happened is there hasn't been much new housing coming in. The government has backed out from what it was doing. And the consequence is housing is deteriorating and at the same time, the price is going up because, because of the demand. So what can we do about it? I'll tell you exactly what we can do about it. We can build 3.2 million new housing units across this country. Yeah. Urban, rural, we can do this. What would be the consequence of doing that? First is we'd produce about a million and a half jobs, local jobs, good jobs, that's a good part. Second, we would bring down, according to Moody's, the price of rents, instead of their continuing to go up, by about 10%. That's their estimate. And think about it. You bring 3.2 million new housing units online. It affects prices overall, not just the new units you bring in, because it affects the market. But that's not all we need to do. Housing, I was talking about it earlier. The number one way that families, working families, middle class families build wealth is they buy a home. And that's how it's worked generation after generation for white families, but not for African American and Latino families. And here's the deal, not just because of gravity not just because that's how it worked out. It was official government policy to redline African-American neighborhoods and prevent them from participating in housing wealth until the mid-1960s. Think about that. That was the policy of our government. And many of those redline neighborhoods have never recovered. So that's how we end up with African American home ownership rates back where they were when housing discrimination was legal. So what does this housing bill propose to do? 3.2 million new units. But it also says we need to take a first step toward rectifying the wrongs of the past and help people in formerly redlined areas be able to buy homes. I'll tell you one more part about this bill. It also requires that we put the money in to fully fund our obligations for housing on our native reservations, something that we have not done as a country. Now, let's talk democracy for just a minute. So this is an expensive plan. There's, there's a lot to this plan, but a lot of help for a lot of people. How do you pay for something like that? I got an answer. <laughs> and the answer is, 
If we just go back to the estate taxes and tax the families that were taxed upon death during the George W. Bush administration. Okay, that's all it is. It's just that far back. We can raise enough money to pay for 3.2 million new housing units and not cost American taxpayers a single dime. So, But here's the part about money talks. So I go talk to experts in Washington. I put this bill together. I talk about this will be senior housing. This will be housing for people with disabilities. This has so many places, housing in rural areas where it's falling apart. Lots of good stuff that comes out of this. Remember, 3.2 million new housing units, plus all the spillover good effects from this and jobs. And who would help pay for this? The 10,000 richest families in America. And do you know what people in Washington say to me? You can never do that. Because 10,000 rich families have so much more power in Washington than millions of American families who are struggling to pay. So what I say to them, you just wait till 2020. Yeah. All right, this is fun. Let's do a couple more. Yeah. Okay. Uh, so, Senator Warren, you've talked a lot about. Um, T tell me your name. Uh, my name is Andreas. It's uh, nice to see you, Andreas. Um, and uh, you've talked a lot about. Um, tackling corruption at a national level and national politics. Um, but I, I want to talk about um, tackling corruption um, on a party level. Um, so given some of the undemocratic behavior between the DNC and Hillary's campaign in 2016 against Senator Sanders, um, what, sort of impact, what sort of impact do you hope to have on the party for a more fair and transparent primary process? Okay. So I'm going to say two things to you. The first one is, I'm not relitigating 2016. <laughs> but I think right now in a 2020 presidential primary that as Democrats, we have a chance to strengthen democracy. And here's how I think we ought to do it. I think that all of the Democratic candidates, whoever they turn out to be, should link arms and say, our primary is not for sale to billionaires. None of us want super PACs to help us, and none of us believe that billionaires ought to be able to self-finance. It ought to be about building a movement person by person by person. This is how we will build democracy. This is how we restore confidence in the Democratic Party. We are the party of the people, but we gotta walk the walk. Thank you. Have a wrap. Thank you. Yes. One more question. Okay. What did I say? Make it a good one. And then we'll do pictures. Bienvenido, Iowa, Elizabeth Warren. Iowa was the first state that allowed women to enter the legal bars to become attorneys. So That's you right. are in a thought leading uh, uh, state of the union. Welcome. Yay. All right. So Go with, Iowa. That, with that aside, I got a question for you because I'm very worried about the course of our corporations. Many of them are offshoring to Ireland, to other uh, offshore locations. And I, I want to know what we can do in 2020 to incentivize them to stay here and balance their responsibility towards our communities because we built their wealth. And I think it's an opportunity in 2020 and I want to hear okay. what we can do. This is great. So great question about corporations. And I'll just do kind of the short version of this and what it starts with, kind of the core of what this is about is back to the point about corruption. Why do you think the tax bill gave away a trillion and a half dollars 
to giant corporations, multinational corporations, and billionaires. Think about it. The estimate that I saw was that these multinationals that got literally, think about that, hundreds of billions of dollars in tax breaks, 40% of their shareholders aren't even here in the United States. So we just gave away, we gave away money. Why do we give away money? Because Washington is corrupt. Because money talks. So part of it has to be, this is why I was talking about systemic change, structural change. We've got to start with an anti-corruption bill. We gotta push them back. And that gives us a chance then to hit them on the tax code and follow, this is gonna be a really shocking principle. You guys ready? Everybody should pay a fair share. But there's one more I wanna, I wanna throw in about this. And that is corporate behavior is determined by corporations themselves. And up until the early 1980s, you can look at corporate minutes, you can look at the groups that represented corporations, and you know what they say? They say, here in America and across Europe, corporations have a responsibility to their shareholders, to their employees, to their customers, to their communities. That was how it was. And it used to be the case that as corporations got richer, everybody participated. That, that the workers got richer too. Everybody got a bigger slice of pie. That changed in the late 80s, and corporations said it's only one thing. It's shareholder wealth and we are here to maximize it, even if it means we're making big money and we lay off our American workers to go somewhere else. We dump all kinds of poisons in the river because it improves our profitability. That's the way corporations have shifted over time. And they don't want to talk about this. They have PR firms, you know, they put little green logos on things. But understand, the rules that govern corporations are not just up to corporations, they're up to you and me. So I have a proposal for something called accountable capitalism that says, yes, that the giant corporations have to get a charter that requires them to respond not just to their shareholders, but their employees, their customers, and their communities. And I think employees ought to be able to elect, let's say, 40% of the board. That will change America. <laughs> so like the, are we going? All right. We're, let's one more, okay, and then one, just one quick housekeeping, because, okay. uh, because I'm going to lose oh. even further control of this, Senator. After this, you're going to go say hello to these folks down here, and the senator is going to stay and see as many people as she can. No, as many as want. As uh, the, the uh, time will schedule will allow, and we'll work this way. Uh, so, congratulations so, on the first trip, and the uh, last question, okay, Senator. Okay, last question. Thank you for being here, Senator. Thank you. This crowd. Um, all of a sudden, this country no longer talks about the national debt. Yep. It just grows and grows and grows. And yet I'm very impressed, actually I'm just stunned that Donald Trump turns around and gives giant tax breaks while our national debt goes up, and he's given it to corporations yep. that are trying to destroy the unions, and yep. many, many workers yep. do not keep up. Yep. My question for you is, when you get to be President of the United States, <laughs> yeah! Yeah. Now, you, you tell us tonight that you will work the Senate, the House, and the Presidency toward a national budget amendment. You bet. That we would have a no, budget, no, wait, a wait, 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 I didn't hear the last few words. Let me say on this, we need to make our dollars, our budgets work for our people. And I agree, our national debt right now is a drag on our young people, on their future. It is obscene what America has done, that America went to war 17 years ago and put it on a credit card for our children to pay. That is fundamentally wrong. That America gave away 
a trillion and a half dollars in tax breaks. Fundamentally wrong. But I think the way we're going to have to do this one is going to be down in the trenches. We've got to rewrite our tax laws. We've got to come back in this economy. And we've got to make the investments again. The investments in infrastructure. The investments in education. The investments in housing. So would you, would you be willing to roll back the tax... Would you be willing to roll back the tax cuts that Donald Trump gives? For the you? billionaires and the big corporations, you bet. Yeah. So, thank you. It's a good question. So, first, thank you all for being here. I really do appreciate this. But let me say something about this fight. You know, this is. This is about dreaming big. And it's about fighting hard. It's about making structural change, not a nibble here and a piece around the edge. And a lot of people say, that's just too hard. You just can't do that. It is just too hard. So let me just say to all of you, people told me after the financial crash, we could never get a consumer agency. That crash was caused one lousy mortgage at a time. One giant bank that cheated uh, one family, another family, another family. Targeted communities of color. Targeted young people. Targeted seniors. And crushed them. But people said to me, the banks have all the money and they will prevail. They spent more than a million dollars a day for more than a year lobbying against financial reforms, and particularly that consumer agency. But here's the deal. We had nothing on our side. We didn't have money. We didn't have big groups on our side. But we got organized. We fought back. And the Consumer Financial Protection Bureau is the law today. Yeah. And yeah. Mick Mulvaney tries to sideline it, but it's doing its work, and it's going to stay in there. I'll tell you another one. Back in 2011, 2012, I got a whole bunch of phone calls from people who said to me, you know, I love you, Elizabeth, but Massachusetts is not going to elect a woman to the Senate. All I want to say is, we got organized, we fought back. I am now the senior senator of the Commonwealth of Massachusetts. And just one more, just one more. <laughs> Wells Fargo. <laughs> You've heard of Wells Fargo, I can tell. So Wells Fargo cheats millions of its customers, decides the way to deal with that is fire a bunch of people who make $15 an hour, right? And we saw what had happened during the crash. The CEOs of the giant banks, she, they just rolled in the money, right? Stayed in their jobs. People said to me, you can't get any accountability, personal accountability, from the executives of a big company like Wells Fargo. But all I can say is, you get in that fight, you push back, and the CEO of Wells Fargo is gone. Yes. So, the point of that is, yeah, it's hard. Well, damn, a lot of things are hard. If they weren't hard, somebody else would have already done it. But we are Americans. And we have a history of coming together to fight the hard fights. The abolitionists. They didn't say this is too hard. The suffragettes. They didn't say this was too hard. America's labor movement. They didn't say this is too hard. America's civil rights movement. Yes, these folks were told it's too hard. Give up before you start. But they organized they persisted, and they changed America.
I'm here tonight because I believe. I believe in what we can do. I believe that this, right now, is our moment. Our moment to dream big, to fight hard, and to take back this country for democracy. Yeah.